Got to push my button there. Good morning. It's great to see you guys today. By the way, I've read several books that say, don't say good morning when you start. I don't care. I'm doing whatever I want. So I like saying good morning. We're family. So I'm going to say a lot dumber things than that today. So Belinda Carlisle had a song in the 80s about heaven. Do you remember what it was called? No, that was Brian Adams. Brian Adams had a song in the 80s about heaven. It was cleverly titled Heaven. Another group had a song called Knocking on Heaven's Door, or actually it was more like Knock, 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 Knocking on Heaven's Door, right? For some reason in the 80s, we were enamored by the idea of heaven, but If you listen to any of those songs and look them up, it's basically about some girl or some boy just being around them is heaven. And now that we're older, I want you to look back at your teenage years and realize that was not heaven, right? (laughs) And, but, but here's some things I know is that in life, sometimes we get a taste, just a, a touch of heaven. I think God lets us have just a glimpse of heaven of what heaven is like. I, you know, we used to go to a house, we, we called it the round house because I'm very creative and the house was round. And, uh, but to get there, you had to drive about 30 minutes on a dirt road through backwoods in the mountains, sometimes in the dark. And when the, we first went there, the road was not very wide. It wasn't much wider than a car. And there were several places as you came around corners, you were on the edge of the mountain. If anybody was coming down uh, you know, and us flatlanders are not used to this, and, and so you'd come around a corner and hope that the driver coming down was better than you and would back up because I wasn't going backwards. And so, uh, but there was this, this just awful road, dusty, dirty cars covered with dirt, trees, drop-offs, terrifying sometimes. But then at the very end, you would get to this little hill and go through this little gate, and you'd get to this hill, and you would all of a sudden you'd be on flat land and there was the house and you could see behind the house and this house overlooked a national forest. It overlooked a valley that had a lake in the middle of it connected to Lake Toxaway if you've been up there. You could hear the waterfall that was at the bottom of the mountain and so you'd pull up and go through this treacherous crazy route and all of a sudden you'd pull up on the top of this mountain. And so many times we got there uh, as the sun was going down. That's just timing wise how it worked out. And, you know, the sun setting, uh, maybe long shadows, just this amazing view. You could see mountains in the distance. And we went from being on this treacherous, crazy, dusty road to this just amazing view and sound and everything. And here's the deal. That's a little bit what it's like if you're a believer, what this life is like. You're not in heaven yet. You know, the days that you wake up and think, oh, life is awful, you're not in heaven yet. Um, The days you wake up and maybe, listen, the best day of your life, the best day of your life is still a dusty road compared to heaven. And so today we're going to look at Revelation, and we're going to do one more next week uh, uh, of this series, and then we'll be done with Revelation, and we're going to talk a little, a few weeks about Esther, but uh, I want to end today, and today we're going to go through a lot of passages uh, uh, pretty quickly, but I hope to give you these, we're going to answer questions about the water of life. You remember in the Bible that Jesus sat with the woman at the well and he said, I can give you water that never runs out, to which the woman was like, uh, what? Which, we don't even think about that because all of us have that in our house. We just turn it on, turn it off. But back when you had to go out to a well to get any water you needed, you got really tired of that. And she's like, I would like that water. You got everlasting water that doesn't run out and I never get thirsty again. I'll take it. And that's what this is talking about. And we're going to get there at the end of this message. But let's first of all uh, look at three questions about the water life. Number one, are you invited to the wedding party? And we're going to pick up in chapter 19, but let me just summarize. 
uh, uh, chapter 18 into the beginning of chapter 19, if you're not a believer, should be terrifying. Now, I've got to tell you this because this happened today. I got up this morning, I wanted to see the weather, and I turned on my TV, and here was a TV preacher talking about Revelation. And let me just, I'm just going to, I'm going to summarize really quickly what most of these guys do. You ready? They just make it up. They literally are just making stuff up. They're telling you, they, these are these five countries, and these five countries are going to kill these five countries, and then this one, and I think this one's this one. And I think, that, and they're just making, it has nothing to do with what's in the Bible. They'll, they'll take one passage and twist it, and then get a passage from Daniel and bring it over here and tell you, I know what this means. And can I tell you a secret? They don't know what it means. You know why I know that? Because ever since, and even before this, but we know ever since the Civil War, they've been telling us what Armageddon is. They've been telling us what the countries are. And by the way, typically whatever religion they're against that day is the mark of the beast, and, and just so you know. And so over time, and so the, the thing that I talked about last week is you will probably have no idea what that is. Your job is to follow Christ. But the reason we love all that talk is the same pe reason people love haunted houses. Because we like to be scared. We like to be freaked out. We like to hear about locusts and wasps and scorpions. And Is it real scorpions? Prob no. Wasps? No. It might be helicopters. That's what I've heard that one recently. And so if you look at those chapters, you look at 18 into 19, there's all this imagery about the end of times that's just powerful, and yet we don't fully understand it. We just know you don't want to be there. And then we pick this up, and I love it. Revelation 19, verse 7 through 9. Now, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Remember, when we started Revelation, the book of Revelation is meant to be a book of joy, a book to bring you happiness. And the truth is, most people don't read it that way. But then when you get here, this is the big picture. This is what's really important. And he says, for the wedding of the lamb has come, his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's people. Then the angel said to me, Write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Now, I do a lot of weddings. I get to be a part of people's weddings. I love being a part of their weddings. I have debated about buying a GoPro to put in my pocket. Because I'll be honest with you, I have the best view of the bride. You don't get that. The cameraman doesn't get it. Even if they sit behind me, I had one cameraman lay across the stage to try to take pictures during the wedding until the bride's mom beat him to death. <laughs> that really happened. I had a golf ball hit me one time. That's true. Rolled up. We were on one of the holes and the ball rolled up between the groom's legs and hit me in the foot. I said, well, that could have been worse. But let me tell you what I love. I love when I walk down here and the bride's getting ready to come in. And the groom's all nervous, and I watch his face as he first sees her. This is the imagery that we're seeing here. It's the imagery of the bride being ready. And guess what? Believe it or not, you're the bride. If you're the part of the church, you're the bride. You're the one that Jesus is looking forward to being with. That's what's amazing. But you don't understand how good grace is. I, you know, I look at my wife sometimes, and I say, Why? Would she put up with me? And then I look around this room and I look at some of the guys here and I think, why? <laughs> right? <laughs> some, of you, some of you should be nodding bigger than you are right now, Chad. Right? And so, and so, right? Right? And so we understand that, right? But yet, God's grace is even bigger than that because, listen, he knows every thought we've ever had. He knows every, And yet... He absolutely and completely loves us. He gives us that fine linen to wear. It's amazing to me that he hands that to us. This is the whole idea of righteousness. Listen to what it says, and we're going to uh, uh, do Revelation, and then I'm going to uh, uh, show you in Romans chapter 3 in just one passage where it kind of addresses this exact same thing to give you context. This righteousness is given through faith 
in Christ Jesus or Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Why? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That word for glory of God means we can't live up to God's standard. We cannot be perfect. God is perfect. We are not. We all fall short. There's nobody. There, listen, if you are disappointed with yourself, that's called being a human. You go on a diet tomorrow, you're going to struggle with being hungry for whatever you can't eat. I don't care what diet you go on. If you go on the non-donut diet, you want donuts. If it's a non Girl Scout cookies, the Girl Scouts are showing up at your house this afternoon with free cookies. I mean, it's just, right? So we're disappointed. We never measure up to the glory of God. And then it continues, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And here's the thing. There's something in us that thinks that I've got to earn God's love. There's something in us that thinks I have to jump a little higher, do a little more. Please, just if he may not like me, I've got to do something. And it says, he gives you this by faith. Now, here's the deal. When you become a Christian, he's the one who changes you. You begin to change. You want to transform. And if there's no fruit in your life, then I would say, are you really a Christian? If you really just want to live for yourself and do what you want to do and want to tell God what's right and wrong, and I'll get to decide what's right. By the way, we're in a world that says, we'll tell you what's right and wrong, right? And so, and so we have to say, Jesus, I want you to be first. And when we surrender to him, what does he give us? He gives us his righteousness, not out of works, but out of faith. Faith says, God, I'm going to trust you. Faith is surrendering your life to Christ. Now, here's the not so pleasant part. Number two, do you know, the, and this is a balance, justice and judgment? Most of us uh, are either one way or the other. We're either truth people. You all know that truth person, right? The person who's going to tell you the truth whether you want to hear it or not, Paul, right? The per- Sorry, Paul, right? And then the love people who won't even necessarily tell you the truth. Like, the love people are not the people you want to have if you come out and say, do you like this outfit? You want a truth person that day. You want a love person after a bad day who just says, it's all going to be okay. You don't want a truth person to go, well, that's what you deserved. You're such a doofus, right? Now, here's the thing. Jesus, and, and when we look at what a mature Christian is supposed to be, we should speak the truth in love, which means we should be balanced, a balanced person. And most of us, though, tend to err on one side or the other, right? Well, that's this whole idea of justice and judgment. See, something inside of us says, well, we just need a loving God who just loves everybody and lets everybody do whatever they want. And yet, we've seen where there's some cities who've decided they're not going to prosecute shoplifting. How's that going? A lot of these mayors are starting to go, you know what, I, I think we're going to change that. We, uh, now that all the shops are closing, suddenly they decided, oh, we've got to do something. Why? Because it's not fair. And there's something inside of us that understands that there's times that even though it's difficult, we've got to have justice. And in order to have justice, we have to have judgment. Somebody has to say, that's wrong. And we don't like that. I don't like that for me. I don't want anybody to tell me I'm wrong. I like to be right all the time, don't you? Does anybody in here like to be wrong? I like to be, right? If you're weird, if you do, right? And so don't raise your hand, Chad. All right, so, so here's the deal, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so here's the deal. God has perfect judgment. You and I don't. Haven't you ever judged somebody wrongly? Thought somebody was nice and they weren't? Thought somebody was mean and they were nice? You ever done that? And so uh, uh, this whole idea of justice and judgment. And so this is what happens. So let's pick up in Revelation chapter 19. And now you go from this imagery of the feast to now we're in this Armageddon mode again, which was back a couple chapters ago, and talking about what's going on in the heavenlies. And here's what it says. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. My Redeemer is faithful and true. Right? Love that. 
With justice, he judges and wages war. And then it talks about his tattoos, which is cool if you're a tattoo person, read those next two verses. Then it says, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen. By the way, this is Roman uh, uh, it's a Roman uh, uh, reminder of how they would come in uh, uh, to fight battles and battle victory. They'd come in on these white horses. Anyway, okay. So uh, uh, coming out of his mouth was a sharp sword, which we talked about in chapter one, uh, to which he will strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. We don't like wrath verses. I don't like wrath verses. When I appear before a judge, you know what I want? I don't want justice. You know what I want for me? Mercy. It's the same thing when you're driving down I-95, right? And that guy passes you, and then you see a cop, and you're like, get him. But then a few minutes later, you're the one that's speeding, and you pass a cop, and you say, oh, I hope he didn't see me. Oh, Lord, right? So we want what? We want grace for us and judgment on other people, and God balances that perfectly. As we look at this verse, it's talking about how he judges perfectly. And so you look at chapter 19 and 20, and these are the verses that are intense about Armageddon and about these kings that are coming along and all these things. And people will say, oh, that's Rome and that's Egypt and that's this and that's that. And guess what? Maybe. When you, when you hear those guys on TV and they got all these pictures and they're, they got these terrifying illustrations behind you and they've got the wall of Babylon behind you and they're talking about Babylon and this and that, just look and go, maybe, okay, what can I do about that? We just know who wins the battle. That's the important part of this passage. And then he talks about the thousand years that Satan's bound, the saints reigning with Jesus, Satan's then free, and then talks about the destroyed, and then it talks about the white throne judgment. And then here's this verse that we need to be aware of and recognize this is the importance for us as Christians to encourage and to help other people to come to dinner. Because dinner is much better than this next passage, but this next passage is in the Bible, so we're going to read it. So hang in there, buckle up, here we go. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And over the years, I've gotten so many questions about what this means and what this is and what hell is like and this and that. Here's my summary. You don't want to go there. I, I've been on rides at amusement parks that I thought I want off and they were two minutes long. So the truth is, whatever this is, whether it's separation from God, that's the fire, whether it's separation from everyone, that's the fire, whatever this is, you don't want this. Listen to what it says here in Romans. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. What's atonement? It's, it's paying for something you don't deserve, taking care of your fee through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Time out. So, so. All of the Old Testament, all of the sacrifices of Judaism, the, the blood over the door in Egypt, which is such a foreign... Con Listen, we don't even like to buy bloody chicken, right? We go to Publix, and they better put that little thing in the bottom, right? We live in a totally different society now. But, but all of these Old Testament things were foreshadowing, English teacher, foreshadowing... All through scripture. God loves foreshadowing. It's his favorite English word is foreshadowing. Everything. You look in scripture, it's all foreshadowing. What? The whole Old Testament was foreshadowing what? What Jesus was going to do. And here we are at the end in Revelation. And here's what he's done. And so then it continues. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, which basically means he's putting up with that, right? He had left sins committed unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. 
Now, the best way to illustrate that to me is it's an old story, and I don't know whether it's true or not. I'm sure it has happened at some point where a judge was on, uh, you know, had his gavel, and the next thing he knows, his son comes in, and his son comes in, and he looks at his son, and his son thinks he's going to get off, and he basically says, you owe a fine of a thousand dollars, and he pronounces sentence, and he does the gavel. And then the judge takes off his robe, comes around, and says, son, here's a thousand dollars. That's what God did for us. He knew that in his justice, sin had to be punished. He just couldn't put up with it. Because remember, we talked about justice. We all want justice. We all want righteousness. And so God, in his righteousness, paid his own fine. Why? For us. That's, that's, that's what salvation is. It doesn't make sense to our modern life because we're not used to that type of thing. But we understand it when there's injustice. When there's injustice and we see somebody hurting that shouldn't hurt. We see somebody suffer who we think, well, they didn't deserve that. By the way, one of the things that I'll be, this is for you. Please don't tell your friend this if they're suffering. But this is for you. We're not in heaven yet. So life is full of sin and full of people who can hurt you full of people who will suffer. Some of us may get cancer, not because of something we did, but because of something somebody else did. There's all kind of movies about corporations who gave whole communities cancer, right? Did they deserve it? No. But we're not in heaven yet. God knows justice. And yet, in His justice, He gives us His righteousness. And then that leads to number three. Have you accepted the faith invite? Now, this is a really rough point for me because as I was working on this point, I was trying to think of a story of something I forgot. And as I thought about it, I realized, oh no, it's Saturday morning, it's 11.50, and I didn't do the VBS video. I forgot with my mom being sick this week, and I got busy and forgot all about it. I texted Randy, Randy, can I get you that video? He said, it better be in the next few minutes. <laughs> oh no. So sorry about all the pictures of me in the video, but that was you know, cut and paste. All right, so, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. I don't know if you've ever used this service. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, there's something we use quite a bit at our house. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called, uh, let me think, uh, Amazon. <laughs> and last week, Kristen said, uh, hey, uh, we need some paper towels. Can you order them? I said, oh, no problem. Be delivered next day. Those will be here tomorrow, my dear. <laughs> I don't know why I feel powerful, like anybody can do that, but hey, I'm good. Bounty. Quicker picker up. Next day comes. It's getting kind of late in the day. I'm like, man, the paper towels have not come. I'm going to get on and check to see where they're at. I get on. I go under orders. You know how to do it, the little person. Huh. There's something in my cart. Oh, no. Order. Honey, those will be here tomorrow. Just because you know about Jesus, just because you've come to church, just because you've learned about him, just because you know about Christianity, just because you understand things, doesn't mean that you've surrendered to Christ. I went to church for 17 years without a relationship with with Christ. I knew all about him. I could tell you about him. I could argue with you about revelation. I could talk to you about backward masking. That was fun in the 70s. I could talk to you about all kinds of things, but the truth is I did not have a relationship with Christ. Why? Because I had put the, the food in the cart, but I never actually took it home. And so the question for all of us is, have you really received and answered the invitation of Christ? And then listen to what it says next, Revelations 21, 1 through Four and then verse six. Then I saw a new heaven, a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, hmm, first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, which is really a cool thought. So heaven comes to earth. You thought that was a Belinda Carlisle song, but it's not. All right. See, see, I was going to get back to Belinda Carlisle. You knew it was coming, right? And so. I saw the new Jerusalem out of heaven, preparing, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, 
God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Time out before I go any further. I want to say this. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody that you just enjoy being around. Somebody that you're just like, this is like the best person. When Jesus was on earth, people loved being around Jesus. The only people that didn't enjoy being around Jesus were religious people. Did you know that? But throngs of people gathered. Why? It was just amazing to be around him. The presence of God is full of peace and love and joy. But listen to what else it says here, and I love this. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. By the way, the older we get, the more we make noise when we get out of a chair. My kids will sometimes say, what's that noise? It's just your dad getting up. Somebody told me they laid tile yesterday. I was thinking, nope. (laughs) Nope, not anymore. I used to lay tile. Now I'm like, I can point and go lay it there. No more mourning or crying or pain. You know, as we get older, we lose friends, we lose family. We know what mourning is. Mourning is goodbye. In heaven, there's no more goodbyes. There's no more pain. There's no more suffering. And then it continues. For the old order of things has passed away. And then he said to me a few verses later, it is done. That's kind of the same idea, a different Greek word, but the same idea is it is finished. You heard that before. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Mm. My dad was a contractor and a construction worker, and he never, he, he never didn't work. Even though he was the head, he always did stuff. He laid block. The last day of his life, I laid block with him. I actually mixed mud and couldn't keep up with the, how fast he was laying block around the house. My dad would come home. I promise you, my dad sweated more than any man in the history of earth. He could come home, sit down, and there would be a puddle because he sweat so much. But every day my dad would come home and he'd get a big glass of ice, fill it all the way to the top. He'd fill it full of water. And I saw him do this a hundred times. He would guzzle that whole big gulp water, full of water, that big gulp cup, drink it all the way down in one thing. And then you know what he would do every single time? Do you remember the Nest Tea Plunge commercial? Right? Summertime's here and we think about that. This water of life is more refreshing than anything. That anxiety that you feel, that loneliness that you feel, that hurting that you feel on earth, that wishing you think something's missing, knowing that something's not right, wishing there was some hole that's got to be filled, all of that, this water of life through Christ, through God's presence, fills that. Because when I drive on those rough roads and I get to the top of that mountain and the sun is going down for just a moment, and I don't know if you've had this happen, I'm just filled with peace, filled with joy. Those moments when you have that in your life, maybe you're on the ocean or maybe you're on a a lake or maybe you're up on a mountain and all of a sudden you get that overwhelming peace, that's just a taste of heaven. It's just a touch of heaven. Of heaven. Listen to what it says in Romans. What did he do? He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. What does justifies mean? Just as if I'd never sinned. God knows every wrong thing I've done, but when I confess to him, when I surrender to him, the Bible says he takes all of that, puts it on the cross, and gives me his righteousness. That's what It means in this chapter of Revelation, with all the war and all the fighting and all this stuff going on here, Armageddon happening, what are we doing? We're sitting at the table in a wedding feast and the best party ever. No hangover. Just amazing. Better than any experience you've ever had, that's what heaven's about. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian. To know that you've accepted the invitation, not just thought about it, not just know about it, not just understand it, but surrendered your life to Christ. 
Said, God, I'm tired of doing things my way. I want to do it your way. I want to do what you have called me to do. I don't want to tell you what's right and wrong. I want you to tell me and let my life change to your way. I surrender my life to you. If you want to do that today, I'll be here after the service. If you're a Christian today and you've got busy, you've gotten busy just living. Let me tell you the best way to live is in the light of eternity. Because the truth for all of us is we all understand that this life is just a breath. It's just temporary. And so if you live knowing there's an eternity, guess what? You can have joy every day. You'll love the people around you better. You'll understand that what you think is a big deal today is not a big deal when you surrender it to him. So I encourage you, Christian, just surrender those areas, those worries, those anxieties back to him today. Thanks for being here. We're going to pray, and then we're going to have our time of offering. Would you join me as we pray? Father, thank you for this time this morning. Thank you for your love for us. Father, I thank you that we've all been invited to the wedding supper. And Lord, I pray that we would accept that invitation. Lord, I pray for each one. If there's one here who doesn't know you, Lord, and they're still uh, uh, discovering the claims of Christ, Father, I pray that they would not stop asking questions, that they begin saying, God, if you're real, show yourself to me. And Lord, I pray they would see you as who you really are. Jesus, thank you for the sacrifice you gave so that we can know you. Bless each one today in Jesus' name. Amen.